Hey guys, welcome to another episode of My Favorite Parts, the show where I go over my favorite parts. My favorite parts. So in this one, we're going to take a look at the first few bars from the 12th variation from the Goldberg Variations by Bach. So we're only gonna focus on the first few bars because I wanna show you how cool it is. So first on background, if you're not familiar with the Goldberg variations, effectively they're variations on a theme or kind of like a harmonic pattern or chord progression, if you will, in modern terms. So there's kind of an aria at the beginning which sets the foundation. And then there's 30 different variations on that theme. The sort of underlying bass line, if you will, is consistent through all the pieces. So a few of the variations are sprinkled throughout our canons. And canons you are probably familiar with uh, something like Frère Jacques, where one person sings one line and then the other person sings the same line, kind of offset in time. So that's what Bach is doing here. And this one is, um, it's called Canone alla Quarta. I don't know if I'm saying that right in Italian, but basically a canon on fourths or uh, as a fourth interval. So what this means is that instead of having the exact same line playing an, an octave apart, like I did with the Frère Jacques, uh, this one is played a, um, a fourth down. And not only that, but it's played a fourth down and inverted, which is really cool. So it's not only offset in time, it's offset in fourths and it's inverted. So one goes up and the other one goes down and together it creates this really beautiful interval. So if we take a look at the kind of main line or the subject, the starting point, uh, it goes like this. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So again, the line is. So it goes down, then an up line, and then if we look at the other part that comes in later, it comes in a bar later. So instead of going starting with G, we're starting with D, which is a fourth down. And instead of going up, so the main line goes, the other line goes, so again, same kind of intervals, but if you almost like a mirror image. And the other line. So obviously if you start them at the exact same time, they clash a little bit. A little bit, but it still kind of works. But what he does is he offsets the other one. It comes in a bar later. So the two together sound like this. I'll play it really slowly. Basically that, and then it keeps going. Or immediately in the second chord, he switches to like a D major uh, scale. So the piece is in G major, as are most of the other variations, except one or two, I believe, which are in minor. Uh, but basically, the G major scale only has one sharp, the F and D major has a second sharp, the C sharp. So you can already see that he plays a running line with that C sharp at the beginning. So here it's C natural. And now he does a D major run. And what's interesting is that the inverted one uh, stays in G during that same bar and it creates this really interesting kind of clash. Now it comes in. So here the right hand was playing a D major and here we're playing the C natural from the G so really interesting kind of subtle detail. And then we have a bass line which is separate and the bass line is very straightforward it's just quarter notes and there are quarter notes following the bass line, which is kind of like the, the foundation of the aria. So at the beginning it starts. That's like the first line and you'll see that kind of general outline in all the other variations as well. 
Uh, so the chords are basically G, uh, D in first inversion, E minor, D, in, and then uh, G in first inversion, C, D, and then the aria you can you can think of it as. Uh, Obviously, the aria goes like this. Etc. Etc. Really, really, really beautiful piece. I would encourage everyone to listen to that if you haven't listened to the Goldberg Variations. It sets the kind of tone for the rest of the pieces. And again, that bass line is still there. And it gets more and more washed out and subtle as you listen to all the other variations. So with that in mind, now we have the kind of basis for the chord progression. So we can go back to our Variation 12. And again, the bass line here is very simple. It's just quarter notes and he's literally kind of following the bass line. Um, at least at the beginning. So it's... So what's cool now is that we have three different parts. So I'm going to show you how all the, both the lines that I showed you earlier, the canon main subject lines, go along with the bass line. So if we play the first line. And then if we play the second line with the bass line. So I'll play it an octave higher just so you can hear the difference. So again, if we play the just the two lines together. So now you might be wondering, there's three parts. There's that bass line, there's the subject, and then there's the kind of response. So we have three different parts, but we only have two hands. So you might be wondering, how are we going to achieve this? And this is where kind of it gets crazy. You have to sort of divide your left hand into two. So you have to kind of make your pinky independent from the rest of your finger. So the pinky becomes like the, the bass note. So you have to make the, your pinky play that bass line. And then you have your other four fingers free to play that response line, the, the, the line that is a quarter or a fourth down and inverted. So this definitely takes some practice and I'm definitely not an expert. I'm not a professional pianist or anything, but I find that it helps to, at the beginning, go really slow and exaggerate the like difference between the pinky and really kind of channel so that you're not just playing like a melody with your four hands, but you're playing like a bass line and you really focus on the pinky playing the bass and then this playing the other night. So basically we have to play this line. At the same time with the same hand as we do.
what I like to do is play it really slow at the beginning and really kind of exaggerate the, the difference between the two, maybe by playing one super staccato and the other one very legato, very like sustained. So maybe at the beginning, just practice playing the bass line with the pinky, very kind of assertive. And then I find it helps to play the other part very drastically different, just exaggerated at the beginning, just to practice kind of dividing the two parts in one hand uh, by playing it very kind of staccato. And it gets kind of tricky here because the, the line crosses over the bass line, but you're playing it in one hand. So the kind of roll of the pinky switches a little bit. So again, play it really slow and kind of exaggerate the bass line. Very long, loud. Obviously when you're playing the piece, you don't want to do this later, but at the beginning, I find it helps. And like, notice how the bass line, I'm going to hold it long, and the, the line, I'm going to play it super kind of staccato, just to divide the two parts. Not only do you have to play those two parts very kind of separate, only with one hand, you still have to play the subject in the right hand. So this piece was very deceptively kind of tricky when I first started learning it. I mean, obviously it sounds really complicated when you hear it, so I wasn't expecting it to be easy. But when I looked at the sheet music at the beginning, it didn't look that complicated, the first three bars. But then when you actually start to play it, you realize how <laughs> crazy it is. And I feel like this is true of a lot of box pieces. They're very like deceptively uh, simple sounding sometimes. But this one is a very, very unique piece, especially when we get into the second part, which I'm not gonna cover in this video, but I would definitely encourage you to kind of listen to it and really pay attention to that, that general kind of baseline theme that's borrowed from the aria. So yeah, when he gets to the other part, it's like really, I don't know what he was smoking when he wrote this, but it's like, it's not a typical melody that you would hear. And even like the, the patterns and the way to interact is not something you would typically sing or even think of composing. It's very, it, it looks and sounds like it should be chaotic, but when you listen to it, when it's performed well, like from somebody like Glenn Gould, uh, then it really kind of shines and the harmonies kind of ooze out of it. It's really something amazing. Anyways, going back to this part. So yeah, we have to play the pinky bass, the subject response with the other half of our left finger, uh, uh, left hand, and then with our right hand, we still have to play the subject. All right, so I'm gonna try to play it slowly so you can hear how the two parts kind of come together. So once more. So I'm a bit exaggerating the bass so you can hear it now, but you want to make it more subtle, obviously, when you're playing the whole thing. So then as you start practicing more and more, you can start playing it faster. Glenn Gould plays it really, really fast. I'm not sure what the original kind of intended tempo is. that up anyways you get the point um kind of rusty it's been a while since i played it but yeah hopefully that gives you a good kind of zoomed in lens into and that's literally just the first three bars and already it's packed with so much kind of density like one you have to play three parts with two hands which isn't that uncommon he um, most of his uh well-tempered clavier book is all kind of three-part stuff anyways but here i feel like the parts are very distinct 
And so not only do you have to play those three parts, uh, there's some interest in the canon. So like the, the response is offset by a bar, it's offset by a fourth interval and it's inverted. So one goes up, the other one goes down. And then there's the rest of the piece is jam packed with all these little nuggets as well as are most of his other pieces as well. So yeah, really interesting piece. I definitely encourage you to listen to it. If you're new to Bach, definitely check out Glenn Gould's uh, I like the 1981 recording better than the 1955, but there's some debate there. Either way, they're both really good. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.